All right, the playoffs are almost here, and the Winning Place podcast is back. My name is Brian Robb, and I'm thrilled to be joined today, making his debut on the Winning Place podcast, Tim McCone of 98.5 The Sports Sub. Tim, it's a pleasure to have you here. We have a lot of ground to cover. Famously known for the, the one of the first and only hosts of Celtics at 7 on 98.5 The Sports Sub. Rest in peace, Celtics at 7. Yes. But yes. you can you can catch Tim regularly uh, throughout the week, filling in, and also weekends with usually Leroy Irvin. There, you guys are been tag teaming a lot there um, on the weekends of the hub. But Tim, how are you? Yeah, thrilled to be here. You're right. Celtics at seven is where I got my start. Uh, it was definitely uh, it was put to bed shortly after I started hosting. So uh, hopefully this podcast has a, a little longer shelf life. But yeah, excited to uh, excited to be here, and I'll try not to tank this for you too. We're recording this in the evening, so this is probably better hours for the podcast here. But let's start here. So we're in the, entering the, the final week of the regular season here. We're recording this on a Tuesday night. Uh, it looks like right now the Miami Heat are about to win against the Charlotte Hornets. That's going to put them two and a half games above the Celtics with, with three to play here. And to be honest, the Celtics have the tiebreaker. But Miami closes with the uh, the Hawks and a road game against the tanking Orlando team. So is it safe to say right now, can we officially put the one seat off the table for the Boston Celtics based on the, this turn of events? Yeah, it's kind of a bummer because it felt like it was kind of trending in the right direction, especially when you had Jimmy Butler trying to fight Eric Spolster yeah, right? Right? <laughs> this time a week ago. It felt like. Things were starting to line up, like maybe the Celtics could actually pull this off and grab the one seat. But you're right. When you kind of look at the the paths towards the end of the season, especially with the Celtics finishing up with Milwaukee and, and Memphis down the stretch. And like you said, there's just uh, there's too much ground to cover at this point. So I think, unfortunately, the one seed's off the table. But the reality of the situation is, Birob, I, I can't believe we're even talking about the one seed at this point from where we nice. were. So at January 1st to even consider that this would be on the table, uh, I think it is pretty impressive by the Celtics, but yeah, I, th- I think you're right at this point. We need to, uh, we need to kind of put that talk to bed. And, you know, like you said, the Celtics, so they close out, they're at Chicago Wednesday at Memphis Thursday, finish up I mean, at, uh, excuse me, at Milwaukee Thursday in a, obviously a pivotal game when it comes to the two and the three seed and then closing out against the Memphis team that will be playing for nothing to close yeah. out the regular season. You bring up the the rise in the standings, how crazy it is that we're even talking about this. I wonder if you look at the record books here, like even 11 to two jump from like the midway point of the season, that has to be close to an, a historic leap just based on, you know, how far down they were and how they pretty much played like the 96 Bulls for like a 30 game <laughs> stretch there and I, yeah, made this a conversation. The, the sample size at this point is is crazy for the Celtics to honestly be one of, if not the best team in the NBA, it feels like really since the, the start of the new year. And you're right. Like, you know, I, I remember on that West Coast swing, especially remember that game where they beat the Sixers in the low 80s and then they go out and they get whacked by uh, the Jazz, give up 137 yeah. points on that first game of that West Coast swing. And I'm like, uh, so this is what this is. Good. We're, we're just going to be talking about the playing tournament again for the Boston Celtics here is, is pretty much what we're, what we're going to be doing. And they have flipped that switch. And yeah, I thought honestly, coming into the year, you were going to look at a, a four or a five seed when you just kind of looked at how deep the East was this year. And they've, I mean, obviously uh, certainly surpassed my expectations. And yeah, I, I did not see a run like this coming. I don't think anybody did quite frankly, no. um, but yeah, it, it's, it's pretty impressive where they're at right now. No, I mean, at that point in January, we were, the conversation was like, okay, so how do they, like Al Horford, you got to shop him, like Smart, like everyone on the table, Schroeder, Richardson. I mean, I, and some of those guys ultimately were moved anyway, which was, you know, the credit to the front office to kind of picking the right parts to keep and to, to move yeah. on from. But yeah, it was it was all about like, they can't keep this together because this would literally just be, you know, you have to make a move one way or the other. You can't just like let it, drag out like they did last season here and have it be another year of, of playing talk. Well, no, and the sample size at that point, right. You're looking at a year and a half now yeah. with this group and you're going, all right, like at some point, even though you really want this to work with what you kind of assembled, you have to kind of admit for that for some reason, this kind of core and what you have going isn't working. And uh, again, the, the fact that they were able to kind of to, to change this as dramatically and as quickly as they did, I think is really impressive. You know, you go back to the beginning of the year and obviously it a new coach, 
You had Jalen out for for that stretch at the beginning of the year too, which I wonder if that kind of played into stuff. But yeah, once they kind of got their their footing underneath them and really hit the ground running in January. And, you know, you go back to the start of it to be Rob, it wasn't like an overly impressive run of teams that they were beating at the start of this thing. It was kind of, you know, a, a, a tomato can ty- type one where they were, they were knocking off, you know, some, some pretty terrible teams. But again, that was something that we haven't seen them even do last right. year. They weren't winning games that they should be winning on a consistent basis. And that kind of started the ball rolling. And then, I mean, they've been an absolute wagon ever since. It's a good point because a lot of those wins were masked by those teams. Like they usually like were down a good player or like you said, yeah. it was just a bad team outright. So, yes. you know, like, Oh yeah, they, they, they beat the wizards by 30. Like, great. Like, and then yeah. you, you took care of business against like the Pacers twice or whatever. And you're right. It did kind of mask. And then, but at the same time, it's like when you win by 30 night after night, after night, like that's even, you can't do that against good teams or bad teams doing that against anyone period for that prolonged of a stretch, like means something. And that obviously became the case. Yeah, it means something. And again, it was something that they weren't doing at all last year. I mean, how many times did they go up against teams last year where you go, they, this team has no business being on the court with the Celtics and you're walking away and Boston's losing, or it's a grind of a, of a game. You're going, I, I don't understand how, how we can be in this situation with the Celtics. And, and obviously, you know, that, that hasn't been the case in the second half and, and really, um, you know, that stretch prior to the Robert Williams injury, when they had really had this thing, I mean, these games were over in like the first quarter, like you said, it was unbelievable, unbelievable dominant performances by them. Obviously it starts in the defensive end with this team, but it's been, uh, it's been impressive. So we'll get to more playoff talk in a second, but just during this run as a whole, I mean, you, you've been following this team closely for years. What has stood out? Like what's the most, what stood out to you the most? Like what, what gives you the most confidence that, okay, this is, this can translate to the playoffs. And this isn't like just a hot stretch. Like this is a meaningfully different than what we've seen the last year and a half, two years, like whether it's a player or just a certain part of the game, like what, what kind of stood out to you the most through this second half here? Yeah. So for me, it's three things, right? I think obviously number one, it's something we've been talking a ton about. And when you kind of look at the analytics and everything like that and the 538 models, it's the defense, right? So defensively, this is, an elite team and you've got a lot of really good individual elite individual performers on the defensive end as well. So obviously, you know, when you have a group of those guys, the team defense, everything they bought into what Ime is selling uh, the second factor, I think is the buy-in factor. You didn't have that last year. It didn't feel like that team really cared or, or bought in uh, especially in that net series where I think everyone in Boston uh, that likes the Celtics was really fired up for the series and everyone that was playing for the Celtics felt like it, they really didn't care. Like uh, they just kind of <laughs> rolled over and died. And, and, you know, you can go back pre bubble to the 2019 team uh, with Kyrie Irving and, and the way that that season ended too, where it just felt like for some reason that mix was just off. And last year it felt like that too. And this year it's the complete opposite. Like you just see the buy-in factor. These guys feel like they enjoy playing with each other, um, which I think is, is certainly uh, um, was not the case uh, last year and definitely not in 2019 uh, with Kyrie. And then the third thing for me is it, it's something that I always look uh, at when you when you look at teams that are going to make deep runs. And it's look, it's it's pretty simple. Um, but do you have an elite player on your roster? Right. Like if you go through the history of the NBA, B Rob, I mean, there's a couple outliers. But really, when you're talking about going all the way back to 1979, I'm a nerd. So I've done this. You're talking about the 2004 Pistons. And outside of that, you have to have a guy, a top five player or someone that's flirting with the top five, right? Like an elite guy. We need you to go get us a bucket. We need you to take over this game. And Jason Tatum, for me, I don't know if he's in the top five, but he's certainly flirting with it, right? And, and that kind of step that he's taken over the last couple months, especially, um, I think is a game changer for this team. And I think that's the main thing for me that kind of changes the ceiling and how I view the Celtics heading into this postseason. It's to a point now with Tatum, particularly if they close this season strong, like this week strong. I don't know if you can keep him off a first team All NBA now, yeah. like realistically. Like, oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Both both ends of the floor, the way he's put up these numbers consistently in the second half of the year. Obviously, the first half of the year, the shooting issues were what they were, but yeah, he's now those are. I mean, that's like a a long afterthought at this point. And if you you know, for as much as it's 
this is bad timing for him. It's, it's too bad he didn't do this last year in terms of, but he's going to see the difference of like, okay, you're on a, a 50 win team now that's yeah. played the best ball in the league in the Eastern Conference in the second half of the year. Like, that's because what are you going to do? Like, well, like LeBron should not be all NBA first team. And like, even like a guy like DeRozan, who's been great, uh, the Bulls are falling apart. And, and Duran has yeah. been, Duran's been hurt a ton too. So can you give it to him over Tatum? I don't think so. I find it hard to believe. And look, no, nobody loves Durant more than I think Durant's probably the best player in the league when he's yeah. healthy. Uh, but like, what's what's he played fit like fifty games this year? Yeah, so like, how like close to fifty five, maybe. So I, I don't know how you could. I don't know how you could justify that with the the sample size that Tatum's put together. Like you said, obviously the shooting wasn't great at the beginning of the year, but we're not talking about a solid three months here where he's been elite. And then on top of it, I, and it's such a good point by you, and we don't talk about it a lot. He's an unbelievable two-way player. Like it's just, it's not just the offensive end. Like defensively, he's a stud too. So, um, you know, you talk about the defense that he he's a big part of that. And yeah, I don't, I, I think it's a, a real conversation. Um, and yeah, for me, I don't know. I don't think you could justify putting Durant on there with the amount of games that he missed versus you know Tatum and what he's done. And like you said, with where the Celtics are going to now be a 50 win team, but when all when all is said and done here um that that's a hard ask which is again it's crazy there's gonna be first team all nba because of the way this year started but yeah you can make a you can make a real conversation for it no doubt yeah the first half season it's like oh he's gonna make the all-star team yeah like, oh, that, like that was that was actually a question at one point yeah now that's... i mean that stretch like we talked about like that utah game i think was in the middle of it when like consistently you're seeing like one for eight one for nine from three and you're like oh like what is going on here and uh ever since then yeah he's been uh he's been locked in and do, do you kind of agree with me in terms of I, look i don't top five is really aggressive like when you look at the players in the league but like i think he's right in the mix of, of, of guys that you want to build your team around moving forward and guys in the postseason that you kind of want at the end of the game i mean he's he's been really he's been really really impressive and i think if you have a guy like that on your roster you got a shot i really do and you look at I agree with you from the standpoint of if you look at his playoff stats, like a lot of guys are um, regular season monsters and then become, you know, paper tigers in the, in the, like the, just the, 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 obviously everything becomes a lot tougher in the playoffs in general. And you're going to see a lot of guys that the numbers reflect that where they just can't get their, their shots. Like they can't create consistently. And Tim and to his credit, Jalen Brown too, have both been guys in the postseason where, their numbers are pretty, you know, close to where they get in the regular season. And the one, the big question with both those guys, and we'll get to it later still is, I mean, in the team in general is still the crunch time situation in the postseason. It's you know, obviously hampered them a ton back in the playoff bubble and going all the way back to 2018, et cetera. Um, but on the whole, Tatum is, you know, has enough tricks in his bag where he can get the shots he wants during the postseason delivers a defensively in the postseason can't be picked on there. So yeah, like that's, that's certainly borderline top five at worst in terms of a postseason player in my mind. And you just brought it up too. And I think the perfect example we were talking about, honestly, is the, from the Boston Celtics from what, five years ago now with Isaiah Thomas, where in the regular season stud, but when the postseason came around, we saw it, it got a lot, got a lot more difficult for him. And for that team, like you said, it's just a different, the postseason's a different animal, right? So you can win a lot of regular season games by just kind of outworking guys and, and really being engaged on back-to-backs and stuff like that. But, um, you know, when push came to shove with that team, there was certainly a ceiling. And I think there was a ceiling for Isaiah Thomas in terms of being that number one option for you, just because of how size-wise, how limited he was. We talked about the defense for a bit here. Let's let's go through a, a ricochet work. shot for Isaiah Thomas, by the way. I know. Come hammer him in the middle of this podcast, but there you go. Hey man, Sorry he's in the that. he's in the Hornets rotation now. Like, <laughs> this is go. like I know they can't get my guy James Booknight any minutes, but all of a sudden right, Isaiah, yeah, just, comes, Isaiah comes, comes in there, right? Playing with play PT, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Just just absolutely brutal. <laughs> um, all NBA defensive team, like we talked about the All NBA team there. Tatum doing a throw shot there. All NBA defensive teams, there's two. Smart is obviously going to make, I think, the yeah. first team at this point. We can talk about defensive player of the year in a second. Who else? Could we see two other Celtics besides Smart on one of those two teams? Like, I think Rob Williams is there. And then then you look at, like, Tatum, too. I'm like, why is why should Tatum not be on one? I, I don't know if he gets there, but, like, I think he certainly has a case for it. 
It's it's crazy, and you're right about Robert Williams too. I mean, you, you look at all the defensive metrics; the guy's a freak, and and not even the metrics, just the eyeball test too, for me with Robert Williams. And like you said, smarts and no doubter. Um, I want to get your thoughts on the defensive player of the year stuff too. I know that for a guard to win that is, is certainly not something that that we normally see. So so do you think that's that's a real possibility? But I, he'll definitely make it. And then you're right, Tatum deserves to be there. And and I think again, defensively and what this team's done. And I think that's why it's so important that Robert Williams uh, hopefully uh, comes back. And I know that that sounds like uh, they're in good shape when it comes to that. But I think when you look at kind of the ceiling for them moving forward, the defense is a big part of it. And and yeah, I think all, all those guys certainly deserve to be in the conversation. No question. So the, the defensive player of the year voting is going to be fascinating to me because you have a situation here where, your traditional big options are on mediocre defenses this year. Yeah. Rudy Gobert, the Utah is like 13th in defense. Okay. He should be disqualified for that. Yeah. Giannis, another obvious choice. Bucks are like 11th in defense this year. Like he'll certainly get votes, but I, I think again, there's, there's an opening for the vote to be split. So you look, okay, what are the best defenses this year? You have the Celtics, obviously you have the Warriors, you know, Draymond Green, if he played a full season would certainly be in the mix there. He hasn't. So he's out yeah. the Suns. I know Mikhail Bridges has gotten some, like, I guess a little bit of buzz there, but he doesn't have like the, the cash J that a, a smarter, right. or someone else does offensively yet. So I'd say like no chance he gets it. Grizzlies are fourth. Jaron Jackson jr. Maybe, but uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe if I could, I mean, he, he certainly could be in the conversation, but you're right. Like, I, I think a, a lot of this name recognition wise with smart certainly is in his favor as well. You know what I mean? Which again, right. is, it's pretty wild the comeback that he's had this year, because I, I thought personally last year, he was not overly impressive on the defense. No, end. that was a big uh, step back from last year. Yeah. Yeah. So for him to kind of bounce back the way he has this year, I think certainly was a, uh, is impressive. And, and yeah, when you kind of lay it out like that, especially with the, uh, Utah and Gobert, because it feels like he's kind of been penciled in here for a few years now. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's definitely, I think he's definitely in the mix for sure. Right. And then the other, I think the other two guys to watch here, um, Miami does have the fifth best defense. I do think Bam out of bio, like could certainly yeah. might be in the best, big in that mix there. But again, he missed a lot of time too with an injury for a lot, big chunk of the year. So you wonder if that disqualifies him. And then beyond that, you know, Embiid. I think we'll yeah. certainly be in that college. He's in the MVP talk. Like they're, you know, so I don't know. It's like, it is like the, the vote. I feel like it's going to be like wide open and there are probably like five or six guys within like striking distance of getting once the, the votes are released. So that's going to be um, fascinating to watch there. Any other awards you're expecting for these guys this year? Most improved player coach of the year. Like you think anything else like, Look, I think it absolutely should be in the mix for coach of the year. I mean, the job that he's done and the turnaround that they've had a hundred percent and uh hand up. <laughs> I thought this thing had the real potential to go off the rails at the beginning of the year. You know, when he's publicly calling guys out, you know what I mean? And, and trying to engage them and it wasn't working. I'm like, well, this, I mean, this could go South. Pretty, you don't typically see coaches in the NBA, uh, do stuff like that. And so when you see him do things like Ime was doing at the beginning of the year, and also the team isn't necessarily responding generally, I'm like, well, this probably isn't <laughs> going to end well. Uh, but look to his credit, uh, they've turned it around and this team's bought in, like they, they're fun to watch. They're engaged. It feels like uh, they 100% not only back their coach, but are kind of feeding into what he's selling and again, I'm, there's not a bigger Brad Stevens fan uh, than me, uh, 100%. But I, I would be the first to tell you that it felt like at the end of last year, um, it didn't feel like that team was necessarily responding to Brad, certainly the way that this team this year is responding uh, to Ime. To yes, I mean, I, I wrote a couple of critical col columns of Ime in like January, which again, yeah. long. And to his credit, I think, I mean, I don't, I stand by what I wrote in those. Like, I think he made the adjustments. Yep. And I also think, like you said, I mean, to, to your point, and just where you brought up Brad, like, I think the front office also made the necessary adjustments. It's like, okay, give, move out the guys that are, you know, email it's going to lead on unnecessarily yep. here because they're veterans. Like, right. just, just get rid of that. So Payne Pritchard can play now. You get yep. the full time versatile garden, Derek White, that can just slide right in. 
And now, and now you have a, the, 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 I mean, the, the trade for Tice is just so huge now because if they didn't have Tice right, I mean, if they have Tice right now, they'd be in such a world of hurt in sure. terms of like what you got, you throw out Ennis freedom for like 20 minutes a game in the playoffs. Like, good yeah, luck. You, can't, you, you, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. You're hundred percent right. Such a good point. Like, you know, it was, it's a trade that certainly wasn't necessarily well received or people weren't like clamoring for that deal at the deadline, but now you look at it, pivotal move. Uh, and you're right. It, a lot of it was addition by subtraction too, like Schroeder. Um, and, and that was a guy that I, I actually loved that signing uh, in the off season for them. And, and obviously um, that's why I'm not a GM in the NBA right there. <laughs> not, it's a good value. It should have been a good value. It should, it should have been. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, you have, you had, but you need more shooting than he had. He was able to give you. So Pam yeah, Pritchard, yeah. come on down. Yeah. All right, McCown. Let's, let's get to the nitty gritty here. One seed looks out of play. To be honest, though, every single team in the East in the, from five to 10 is still on the table as an opponent right now, based on where the Celtics finish. You literally, you can't do any jockeying yet if you're Ime Odoka. So for you right now, but there are two obvious paths you can take. You can take the door number one, which is, hey, we want the number two seed. We want to get home court advantage in the second round, no matter what. And we're willing to roll the dice against seeing Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving in the first round, which is, I wouldn't say probable, but probably a likely scenario. Right. From the two right. seven spot. Yeah. Um, especially since the Nets won tonight, Hawks and Hornets lost. So they're back in the driver's seat for the eight spot there. So they look like the Cavs look like they're going to be seven. Nets yeah. are eight. Nets are going to kick the crap out of the Cavs in the playing game and get that seven. Yeah. So you have, you're inviting that possibility there. That's door number one. Door number two is take your foot off the gas, you know, win a game to get home court and then cruise on into the three or four spot for a first round matchup with the Bulls or Raptors, which I don't think the Celtics care about a ton either way in terms of the, those, those matchups. What door are you taking, Tim McCone? Ah, uh, this is this is so tough. Ultimately, and, and I've actually come off of the Brooklyn stuff because I've been a big proponent of like I don't want to see Brooklyn at all. I'm absolutely terrified of them. But the Ben Simmons stuff, uh, you know, I know that they just came out. He's not going to be in the regular season of playing, so maybe I find it hard to believe that he's just going to step in. Suddenly, right. what do you got of him in that situation? Right. Like that, that. So to me, you can take that off the table. Um, you know, reading up on the Seth Curry stuff, he sounds like he said that he wanted, he needs a month off at some point to get a hundred percent. So, you know, if he's, if he's not feeling, uh, you know, a hundred percent and you're, you don't have a hundred percent Seth Curry, um, and a team that gives up, uh, 270 points a night, it feels like, like you can score on them. No problem. But ultimately, Kevin Durant's on the roster, and that 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 terrifies me a lot more than. And I, I like Nick Nurse, but like <laughs> and Durant scares me a lot more than that. So I, I'm going to go with uh, the the second option there. I'm going to try to avoid uh, Brooklyn, but I'm not as scared of them as I once was. I just look if you can avoid playing Kevin Durant for as long as possible, like that's that's ultimately the path I'm going to go. And 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 nobody's more down on Kyrie Irving than I am. Um, but he's still really, really good at basketball. Uh, and so if he's engaged and you have Kevin Durant, like that's just a matchup that I still don't feel a hundred percent confident in with the way that Chicago is playing and the Lonzo ball stuff feels like he, he's now done. Um, and they've been a, an absolute mess for a while here. Um, if I, if I can get them, yeah, I would have, I, they should absolutely wipe the floor. Uh, with Chicago, Toronto is obviously interesting because of the the vaccination stuff. But if everything's in order there, despite the fact that Nick Nurse is is the coach, and I have a ton of respect for them. Um, you know, that's another team that you should take care of business for. Brooklyn, I think you win that series, but am I as confident? No, I'm not. So I'll, I'll go with door number two. What about you? I'm still door number two here because yeah. it's, it's Kevin Durant. And yeah. you don't have, and you don't, and you, you're not going to have Rob Williams in that series. Right. And you want to have the best player in the series. And you're not yep. going to have that if you place the Nets. You're easily going to have that if you face the Raptors or if you face the Bulls. And I agree, though. Like the Bulls are definitely number one right now. They're kind of falling apart. Oh, it's, exactly. you know, the, their, their, their defense. It's like, yeah, this is what happened. You have Vucevic and like DeRozan. 
and Zach Levine is like your defense here. Like you're, it was kind of smoking. Not, I mean, they played well in the first half of the season, but that, that, that scheme was smoking mirrors. Obviously now you take Lonzo out of it. That's yeah. one of your best defenders. Yeah. Things come back to earth there. And so the, the, the issue here though, I think is the, the Sixers and the Bucks know this too. So I think they're going to be trying to do the exact same thing as you are. And you're playing the Bucks on Thursday. Yeah. So what what's your play here are you, are you resting you know they, they need to win one more game they need to lock in i think one more win to to ensure that they have home court to the top four teams because if if the raptors went out or something like that they could still theoretically try to fight that's i mean it's not going to happen but like yeah you yeah i expect them to take care of business against the bulls on wednesday and try to beat that team against the bucks how do you play this if you're in me i don't are you saying like you you playing some guys and resting guys in the second half or are you just saying hey al Tatum, Jalen, how's that me? Oh, you, well, we're going to rest second half back and back time. We're going to rest this rest up. Malik Fitz, get out there. Next right. Huskets, get out there. Like what, how, how, how are you, how hard, how obvious are you going to be about this? I know and this is a tough part too, because if you're the Celtics and you're a Doka, like, I, the, like we're having this conversation and I'm sure they are too, but like, how do you present that to your guys? And then also say like, Hey, like we 100% believe in you. You're capable of beating everybody, but we're going to go out of our way to avoid you know, the Brooklyn, I, I, I don't know. It's really, it's, it's, it's a tough sell. It's a tough sell. Um, yeah. I, I guess the rest thing like is kind you gotta, of, you got to rest them because you can't like, you can't stop playing in the middle of the game, right? Like it's like, no, you're, you're, you're not going to do that. So you're just not going to dress guys. I think is, is probably the play. Right. Um, yeah. but again, I, look, yeah, I, I, th- I think that's the move. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, the, I, the only, here's the one, thing you i guess you can say we go for the two when obviously it's like okay if you're serious about making a deep run like rob, rob williams or no rob williams like you should be able to be a, a brooklyn team that probably doesn't have ben simmons going like you yes. and like that that shouldn't be you shouldn't in, in theory be worried about that even though we already talked about why you should be to to some degree and then number two i do think there's something you said if you can if you know philly is going to be that three seed which you're not going to know technically. I think that is ideal. Like if you can get to the Eastern conference finals without having to deal with Miami or yeah. Milwaukee, yeah. that's, and have them take out each other. That that's a big win. So that's I think a, that is, that's the counter argument of being like, okay, you know what? If you beat the bucks, that probably knocks them down to four. Yeah. You can take the two, you get home court against Chile as opposed to being, okay, you, you have to face the Raptors in the first round, which is from the four, if you kind of tank it. And then, which I think, yeah, that could be a, you win that series, but that's probably going to be a tough series. And then you have Miami on the road in round two. You're going to be underdogs in that series, I think. Yeah, no, no, I'm with you. When you look at the East, I mean, what teams realistically scare you uh, with with the Celtics right now? Because for me, like I, I have, you know, we talk about kind of avoiding Brooklyn. And I think part of that for me is just the way that it ended last year. Like it would just kind of be disheartening if you went out round one against Brooklyn this year, coming off of the year that you just had, I don't expect that to happen, but man, that would, that would suck. That would really, that, that would be, that would be a terrible way to end the year, but I think you win that series. I'm not necessarily afraid of them. Uh, I might change that, you know, 24 minutes into, <laughs> uh, into that series. But as of now, I still think the Celtics win that series, but like the 76ers, uh, I'm not afraid of the 76ers. Uh, for me, it's really the Bucks. I think, and the Heat are the two teams where I, I think that you're really going to, um, you're going to have a, uh, your hands full. Um, but the 76ers, I just, I don't buy it. Like Harden's not the same player he was anymore, for sure. Um, we already know what he is like in the postseason. Um, but it, I don't, I, I don't love that team, especially from a depth perspective now too. Oh, no question. I mean, their bench is, you know, yeah. you're, they're playing DeAndre Jordan, big minutes off the bench. That, that, <laughs> that, that tells you yeah. Yeah. all I need to know right now. And then you have, I think in the playoffs, like Embiid is still unproven to a degree. Like, I think he's, you know, he's a factor, but you have, you have a, someone to guard him now, now Horford. Yep. A usual, what, who has been in some of his kryptonite in the past in these <laughs> moments. Yeah. And then you have a rookie or a second year guy, Maxi, who's like, you know, who really hasn't shown much on the postseason level yet. Tobias Harris, that's not going to scare anyone. And then, oh. and defensively, that whole team, it's like you yes. have all, all sorts of people you can pick on there. So, yeah. Who, does anyone scare you more out of Miami and Milwaukee? Like, if you're going to power rank 
power rank, give me the top five teams in the East then, like including the Celtics then. Like where do you, where do you put them? Do you put them behind both those teams? Um, I, I don't. I actually have Milwaukee probably one just because of, of, of Giannis and the fact that that team's done it now before. Um, I think the Celtics probably two. I put Miami behind them a little bit and I know that they're going to walk away with the one seed. Um, I just, last week wasn't normal. Like the Jimmy Butler, (laughs) Eric Spolster thing. Like I can't get that out of my mind. And so they're like, there's something going on there. Um, and who knows, maybe they'll write the ship. Um, but I also think that you're going into that series and and look, I know you did in the bubble as well saying that we have the best player, uh, on the court with Tatum, but like you have the best player in that series and Jason Tatum. Uh, I know there's a lot of nice pieces in Miami. I know it's a really good team. Um, but I actually, I, I think I would, I think I would take the Celtics uh, against Miami, but it's really those three, I think have kind of separated themselves. I put the 76ers a notch below them. Uh, and then, like you said, Chicago is an absolute mess. Like I, they're, they're a mess. Cleveland's a disaster now. Um, you know, Brooklyn is what they are. Uh, like you said, so I I'd probably put them kind of with the 76ers a notch below those, those other three, but I think it's really Miami, Boston and, and Milwaukee. Uh, I think it's going to be one of those three teams coming out of the East. And I'd feel really confident, by the way, if Robert Williams did not get hurt, I would, I was, I, I really felt good about the Celtics coming out, uh, coming out of there. Now we'll have to wait and see what he's like coming back. But um, I think it's between those three teams. Yeah. I'm, I'm hundred percent with you on that. I still, I, this, this winning streak for Miami has kind of turned me the other way. Like they've, I watched a lot of them in Toronto the other night. And we, all, we, yeah. we saw what they did against. I don't think the Celtics played particularly well in that game where no. they went up here. Um, yeah. But they, I think they're starting to get their pieces. Like Lowry is just looking like himself again. Yeah. And they got all these guys like, you know, Kiro is just such a problem for the Celtics, I feel like, a lot of the time. And you have the Max Struces of the world who just come out and, you know, <laughs> they go to Miami and they become, you know, starting Crazy. caliber players. Yeah. And so, again, with that and just the, the late game issues the Celtics have, and the Rob Williams situation coming back from an injury, knowing how much of a handful Bam will be in that series. Like if Miami has home court there, I give them, I'd probably go, yeah, Milwaukee one, Miami two, Boston three, Philly four and five, and then, you know, Brooklyn five there. Yeah. Oh, so it's, but it's tough. Cause you can't plan for that. Like, yeah, you, I, you ideally try to get them both in there, but you have no idea how Philly's going to end up the season. You have no idea how Milwaukee's going to end up the season. So that's, you know, the two, three, four thing is going to come down to the last day of yeah. the year, probably in all likelihood, which is makes it a, a huge bear to plan for. No, it's, it, it's crazy. I don't think there's any other team, honestly, in the East, when you look at this though, um, and like you said, I think Chicago at the beginning of the year was certainly impressive. That thing's falling apart. Uh, Toronto, I just don't think uh, has the horses, obviously, although Siakam and, and Scotty Parnes have, uh, have both been impressive to me, at least this year. Uh, then Cleveland, um, I don't even, is Mobley going to be back for the postseason? I think so. Yeah. I think he's supposed to, yeah. Like, I think he should be ready to go. It sounds like Jared Allen supposedly yeah. will be ready to go. I mean, I honestly don't expect him to get out of the plan. <laughs> like, no, no. Like, no, they right. probably lose to Charlotte or yeah. Atlanta after they get their ass kicked by the Nets in yeah. that 7-8 game, uh, which is too bad because that was, like, a really fun story. No, it was. And, yeah. also, and that should be, they like, they should be the reason, like, they're, like, why the play in tournament sucks. It's like, yeah, you have a great feel good story. This team should be in the playoffs, but no, you, you get injuries at the end of the year and you're screwed. And then you're, you're good. You're, you're gone. And then, I mean, the Hawks are probably the most disappointing team. I think in the, I mean, either of them or, you know, the Knicks obviously had some buzz going into the year, but um, I mean, the Hawks have been, uh, that's not a team I'm scared of. And certainly not, not something I think the Celtics would, uh, would, would care about if they somehow got out and then, you know, you were playing them. All right. Well, that will do it for us here. We have six days left here to kind of go through all these scenarios, figure out where things are going to land. Well, I guess one of this, where, what's your prediction? Where do they end up in the seeding here? Uh, I think they're going to wind up as the two seed. And I think I'll go as far as the Eastern conference finals, be Rob. And then, and then, we'll, well, then I'll have to, then I'll have to come back on the pod. The recalibrate. Then. But if they're going to make a finals run or not. Yeah. Which means by the way, they'll get, They'll get knocked out. They'll get swept in the in the in the first round there. Yeah, the net the uh, Nets Durant goes yeah. for sixty four straight games. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, yeah. Irving will Irving will stomp on the logo again. <laughs> Everyone, will, yeah, that'll be it. Yeah. I tell Thanks. you what, 
That the Garden will be if that's game one, Celtics oh. Nets. Oh, that will be first get get all the ass clowns out of the garden who could freaking throw yeah, bottles sure. like be complete oh, yeah. idiots. Yeah. But yeah. from a from a atmosphere perspective, oh, it'll be on fire. It's on fire. Be, yeah. That'll be something else. Yeah. Um, but I like it. I like where your head's at. And then okay, and then what's your where's your Rob Williams return prediction? What what does he come back well, early? Surprise return in the first round? Or second Look, round? I, I, I would love it. I, I don't know why. Maybe I'm just like optimistic and then just super naive because like I, I'm still waiting for Shaq to come back. And what year was that? Was that <laughs> yeah, 2011. 2011. The cap is uh, fine. I, yeah, exactly. No, he's coming back. He's don't worry about it. Uh, so yeah, Shaq never came back. KG in 09, same thing. Yeah. Uh, but this feels different, I guess. Uh, you know, and and it's Stevens, not Ainge. So, so who knows? Maybe this is actually going to happen. But uh, I, for some reason, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic with this one. And if he comes back, I think that's a, that's a game change. Like I said, I was over, borderline overly confident they would come out of the East when they were. I mean, because they were just destroying teams yeah. uh, at that at that point. And uh, so. We'll see. Hopefully he comes back and they, they can kind of pick up where they left off. Cause they were, uh, they, they were a wagon. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta hope you're, I mean, you're going to have to be at full strength to get out of this Eastern conference. Yeah. I think regardless. Yeah. And if they can get there, that will make things, it should be an awesome East playoffs period. Like all the more fun in the final two rounds here, but Tim McCone, this was a lot of fun. Make sure you're yeah, following Tim. Great, Follow yeah. Tim at Tim underscore McCone on Twitter for a bunch of Celtics and UConn takes. And um, and bad jokes and no, actually they're good. No, Tim Tim's Tim's one of the best deadpan jokes out there on Twitter. So make sure you're, you're following that. on there. That. Um, there you go. No. So yeah, <laughs> check him out there. He'll be back soon enough here on the Wing Place Pod. In the meantime, rate, review, subscribe us to us on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. And we will be back with you guys later this week. Thanks for listening.